<clears throat> this is the fourth Ravrilovsky show uh, podcast on Tishvav because it's our fourth year. And uh, every year I'm hoping that I won't have to do this. I'd much rather do a podcast where I'm uh, interviewing Melech Mashiach and what it's like to be the Mashiach and what it's like to bring the Geula and to Kla Yisrael and you know, those sort of things. And uh, unfortunately, here we are again. Now, as you know, from my previous three uh, Tisha B'Av programs, uh, I sit on the floor and I usually explain a kinah. And I chose not to do that this year. And uh, I want to explain what my thinking is. Tisha B'Av this year is Shabbos. That means that Tisha B'Av is not really observed. And according to one view in the Gemara, that's it. There is no Tisha B'Av this year. Tisha B'Av comes out on Shabbos. You commemorate Tisha B'Av on Shabbos. You eat, as the Gemara says, uh, meals like Shlomo and Melech in his, uh, in his greatness. And uh, there wouldn't even be a Tisha B'Av. And in fact... This year, the Tisha B'Av is really the tenth of Av, and it's a uh, Tashlumim. So, in Halacha, there are aspects that are uh, more makel. Uh, for example, this year, um, if you're a Sandik at a bris, you don't have to fast. Rishlomo Zaman Orbach, who was not well, would always try to be a sandik on a year like this on Tisha B'Av, so that uh, it was very hard for him to fast because he was old and he wasn't well. He had been sick a lot of his life. So, uh, you know, there, there are certain difference, certain certain uh, leniencies that are possible. Now, the first two of my Tisha B'Av uh, podcasts were among the most watched uh, episodes of the Rabbi Olavsky show. And I believe it's because on Tisha B'Av, people are looking for something meaningful to do. Uh, by the third one already, it was old hat, because um, Tisha B'Av has become the day of uh, videos. Every organization makes videos, and it's it's so many different things to watch that, you know, poor little Robert Olavsky explaining some insight into Tisha B'Av, it doesn't stand up to the multi-personality, uh, uh, star-studded videos with all the special effects that all of the organizations make. So, uh, so these are really just for the people who feel a certain uh, closeness to me and to what we do here, who are probably going to be watching this. And uh, and I say it all the time, that our struggle is for meaning. And when we have a day which is set aside to mourn uh, the destruction of a building 2,000 years ago, and we know all the other tragedies that took place. And really, those are the ones that people focus on. There's always a Holocaust video or some other terrible tragedy that we try to focus on. Because uh, the Pesim Mikdash and the loss of that is something that's too difficult for us to relate to. So uh, we watch these things to try to help us. So I'm going to start, we have a sponsorship, which again, I've never done on a Tisha B'Av video, but because, like I say, this year is not really Tisha B'Av, we're going to, we're going to, uh, we're going to do it a little differently this time, as I mentioned. Uh, it's sponsored by Ellie and Shira in honor of their anniversary. Thank you, Rabbi Alassi, for keeping us inspired and entertained. Thank you to our parents for helping us so much with our kids and for everything else that you do for us. May we continue to bring you Nachas and Simcha for the next hundred plus years. On me. So, uh, it's, it's interesting that Dafka the Tishabov podcast is being sponsored 
for an anniversary and not for a yurt site. You'd think, you know, there's so many people who sponsored for a yurt site, not the Tishbev one happens to come out that it was for a wedding. That's because the geula is described in terms of a wedding. The geula is going to be when there's the sounds of a chosen and a kala. And that's why when a couple gets married, the bracha we give them is, you should be zeichet to build a bias ne'aman b'Yisrael. What's a bias ne'aman b'Yisrael? The base of Mikdash. It's a mishkan. Eliezer comes back and tells Yitzchak about all the nisim that took place, and he says, let her come into my mother's tent, and let's see if the nisim of the base of Mikdash take place. Because our home, when Bilam wanted to curse the Jewish people, he looked at their homes and said, Ma tovu ahalecha Yaakov, mishkan asecha Yisrael. Every home is a mishkan. So when we get married and we build a home, we're building a base on Mikdash. It's, it's a, it's a place of hashros hashchina. You know that. When a chasen and kala says a man and a woman live together, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is there with them. And he, and he brings his shechina into that home. So, uh, so yeah, it's, it's appropriate. It's appropriate. Um, to, to understand where the simcha comes from and how the simcha is supposed to be. And that's why he says Rabbi Tzaddik, that the Gemaras that describe the Chorban are in Masechah's Gittin. Because when that Kesha between a husband and a wife breaks down, that's Tishabav, that's Chorban. That's the exact opposite of what a Geula is supposed to be and what we are hoping for. Isn't that the plaintive kinna? And we'll have to talk about this in greater detail. Uh, hopefully not on a Tisha B'Av video because there'll be no more Tisha B'Av, but, um, Elit Zion that we sing at the end, the Almana who lost her husband of her youth, that, that love. And by the way, you don't have to be young for that. My parents were married almost 50 years when, uh, when my father passed away and my mother was just so devastated. She lost the love of her life. She lost, she lost the person who her whole life was for. I remember she, uh, a few months later, she got sick with something and uh, we called the doctor and he sent an ambulance to go right to the hospital. So I said to him, why is it that serious? And he says, people have been married a long time. When one spouse dies, the other one usually dies within a year from totally unrelated causes. But that's how powerfully linked they are. So, uh, so that, that loss, that loss that we have, that, that uh, special feeling. So what I want to talk about this year, like I say, since it's not Tisha B'Av, it's, it's the tenth of Av. I want to talk about what we can do to change things a little bit. And uh, as you know, there are a lot of programs around this time focusing on Shmir Salashin. It's, it's always strange to me when people say, yeah, I went to a Shir I went to a Lushan Hara Shir. You, you don't need a whole Shir on how to speak Lushan Hara. Most people, they can do it very easily. You want to shmir us a Lushan Shir. That tells you to be careful with what you say. And that's why usually the Parsha before Tisha B'Av is Parsha's Dvorim. This year, it's the Parsha we read on Tisha B'Av. Dvorim. Dvarim means words. And on some level, it means the words of Moshe Rabbeinu turned into Torah. Now, how you stim that together with the fact that the Torah existed before creation, is Talgaba Raisa Ba'alma Alma, Kosh Baruch looked in the Torah and created the world. I'm not getting into all that. 
but it tells us that our words are Torah. Now, you know this, because at the beginning of Parshas Matos, we have a din of Nidarm. And I say, I ate a disgusting cherry. I say, that's it. I'm never eating cherries again. You don't have to say, I promise. You don't have to say, I swear. You just say, I'm never eating cherries again. That is a nether. You have now created a new love in the Torah, thou shalt not eat cherries. And if you decide you want to eat cherries, and there are two witnesses, and they give you a hasra, they warn you, and you eat it anyway, then they'll take you to Basin and give you malchus for the crime of eating cherries. But I'm allowed to eat cherries. Everyone's allowed to eat cherries besides you because your words created Torah. You created a new Metzius. The Maharal always points out the relationship between the word Daber and Davar. It's the same letters, just different Nekudot different vowels. Daber is to speak and davar is a thing. Because ba'asara mamoris nivra olam, Baruch who created the world by speaking. It was the power of speech that Hashem used to bring the world into creation. And uh, that means that every thing is a word. That's the idea of people Kabbalistically being able to say things and change the Metzius. Because if you know the word that controls everything, you can control it with the power of Dibor. Hashem created the world with Dibor. Baruch she'amar v'haya ha'olam. He spoke and the world came into existence. The Koch of Dibor. So the Miraglim come back with a Deba Ra'a. They said something bad. And you know, an Echa, many times the Aleph Beis is repeated. With one exception. The Pusik for Ayin and the Pusik for Pei are reversed. Why? Because Ayin tells you, look, and then speak. Or as I heard Pesach Kron say once, you have two eyes and one mouth, so you should look twice before you speak once. And they spoke what they didn't see. The speech came first. We don't really care what we say. Words have no meaning. We uh, we say whatever we want. There's a breakdown of of emes. There's a breakdown of what's considered appropriate. In the beginning of Psachim, it talks about the concept of Lushan Nakia. Lushan Nakia is not what many people refer to as Nivel Peh. People think Nivel Peh is where you um, use a bad word. Fortunately, we all know what they are. Presidents of the United States use them. But uh, there was a time when nobody would use, would use a bad word. That's not nivel pet. Nivel pet is saying things that are inappropriate. But using bad words, that's a whole different category. That's called lush nakia. And how do you know you're not allowed to say something that's not clean? Because the Torah goes out of its way instead of, in Parshas Noach, saying, Behema Temeya, it says, Behema Sheino Tahira. Animals which are not Tahav. Now, sometimes it says Behema Temeya. Why over there? Take a look in Rabbeinu Bachaya, he discusses it. But it's there to teach us a lesson, and that is you don't say bad words. And I'm not just talking today about the s- certain words that even in society they understand you have to bleep out. I'm not talking about that. 
in my house, my kids knew. There were two words we didn't say. Stupid and shut up. We didn't say that. That was us in our house. And when one of my kids would get very angry and they wanted to curse, they would say, you're a stupid shut up. That was the worst they could possibly imagine. And it, uh, sensitivities have obviously dropped. I was working in Kiev in America, and the English word for Gehenna and a synonym for Hoover Dam, these two words have entered into uh, common usage. They're not even considered a bad word anymore. I was working in Kiev for 10 years. I came to Israel. I was planning on moving here, and I spoke in yeshiva. And I was not conscious of it because you get so used to a way of talking. The yeshiva said to me afterwards, listen, we don't use those words here. I had to, I had to really work to change because it becomes such a part of you. And I remember I was speaking once on Hanukkah. Rabbi Septimus comes over to me afterwards, and he says, how do you feel comfortable using the word D-A-R-N? He wouldn't even pronounce it. He said, you know how long it took me not to say D-A-M-N? This is, this is like a big madrig for me, you understand? But you understand that words like gosh and uh, darn, you know, these are just, or heck, these are just ways of saying the words that you're not supposed to say, just in a different way. You know, three asterisks. But everyone knows what you're saying. And I realized that there's a way to go for that sensitivity. The Gemara doesn't say pig. It says, Dova Ache. Who would say such a word? And the Gemara says that these two Talmudim were exhausted. There was like such a long shear. It was exhausted. And one of them said, I'm as exhausted as a goat. And the other one said, I'm as exhausted as a pig. I'll tell you the truth. I don't get either one of them. Why is a goat exhausted or a pig? I, don't, I, don't, I, never, I never understood that. But when Rebbe heard, he says, the one, the one who said pig, he says, he, he's never going to make it. He's never going to be anybody. How could you? How could you have that lack of sensitivity when you speak? There's, there's a way to speak. Yeah. Um, it uh, tells a story about uh, two kohanim. He used to get a tiny little piece of the lechem upon him, and the miracle was that it. It uh, it filled you up, and uh, uh, the uh, one says, "I got uh, a piece of lechem upon him the size of a bean." The other one says, "I got a piece the size of a lizard's tail." So when they heard this, they said, "He can't be a kohen. A kohen would never refer to the lechem upon him that way." And they checked into him, and sure enough, he wasn't. You, you can't talk that way. You don't use these kind of words. Teddy Roosevelt had this word that he would use, swine. Let's say you're a swine. And he made it sound like a curse word. Or the two words, neither one of them is really bad, when you put it together, drop dead. You ever hear anybody say that? Wow. Besides the fact that it's a horrible thing to say, but just the way you say it. How does a person say something like that? There's gotta be, there's gotta be a way that we speak the words that we choose. Err on the side of caution. Because uh, we live in a society now where words mean nothing. And say anything you want. Former Vice President Al Gore said recently 
that if you oppose his program to fight climate change, you're like the police officers outside of the school in Vivaldi who did not stop the murderer from killing little children. You're allowing murder. You stop to think what you're saying. Somebody pointed out in the old days, in England, one of the worst things you could say to somebody is good day. Well, then I say good day to you, sir. Yes, but I said good day. <laughs> That's the context. How are you saying it? What do you mean? And it's a big problem. It's a big problem. We, we, we've lost, we're in a door where there's no sensitivity. Our words are meaningless. You know what it was in the old days, if you wanted to send a message to somebody? You took your quill and you dipped it in your inkwell and you wrote out a letter. You'd sprinkle a little fine sand on it so that it would dry quicker and it wouldn't streak. You'd fold it, put it in an envelope, give it a stamp, and send it with a courier. Take months to get there. And the famous story, Abraham Lincoln. The Civil War was a story of one general after another not living up to potential. There were a few victories. And the major victory, which was considered the tide, turning the tide at the high watermark of the Confederacy, is when uh, the Confederates were looking to find shoes at a shoe factory. And they bumped into the Union Army being run by General Meade in the town of Gettysburg. And Lee suffered a defeat. First real defeat that Lee had ever. And he began retreating. But it rained on January 4th very heavily, and the river was flooded, and he couldn't get across. And if Meade had gathered his troops and pursued him, that would have been the end of the Civil War, July 1863. Instead, it went on for another two years, tens of thousands of casualties. All of that could have been saved if General Meade had just got himself together. And so... Abraham Lincoln wrote a very harsh letter to General Meade, how you could have ended the war. And if you had just pulled your troops together, you had enough people. Lee was defeated. He was stuck. You could have defeated him. He would have had no choice but to surrender. And the question is, what did General Meade respond when he got the letter? And the answer is nothing, because he never got it. Because Abraham Lincoln had a policy when he would write a letter that he would put it in his drawer and wait a week before he sent it. We write emails, WhatsApps, texts. We don't have time for punctuation, capitalization, spelling. Joe Biden just sent out a tweet. He spelled the word wrong. I mean, it's not like he sends out the tweet. as people do. You think you put on a spell check, you know? We don't have time. I have to tell you what I'm thinking right now and say whatever I want, and then it stays out there. How many, how many careers have been destroyed because of stupid tweets that people put up on Twitter? I've learned one thing if I ever decide to pursue a life of crime. Yeah, don't send emails. It's really dumb. <laughs> Everybody finds the emails afterwards and they bring them up. But there's this uh, sense, I have to tell you what I'm thinking this second. Instant messaging. i got to tell you now. I have to say whatever I'm thinking. And the ability to stop and think, what am I saying? How is this going to affect the people that I'm speaking to? I've told the story, I think, in the past there was a time when I would do a program on Tisha B'Av um, where we had different speakers who were all explaining different kindness. 
I took what I thought would be relatively safe, because I have gotten into trouble in the past. I, I looked for a pretty safe kid, and I talked about the 24 cartloads of Gemaras that were burnt in the streets of France. And I wanted to talk about uh, covered base, uh, a medrash covered base, a Knesset covered svarim. That was my only topic. I read a letter to the editor that had been written to the Jewish press. It must have been 1995, I think. I may have saved it someplace, but it made a deep impression on me, and I decided to read it in this context. Fifty years ago, what would a person have given to hear Chazar Sashatz? Fifty years ago, what would a person have given to be able to hear Kriya Satar? Fifty years ago, in the Holocaust, what would people have done to be able to answer Amen to a Kaddish? And now that we have it, do we take it and appreciate it? Or do we talk? Do we not pay attention? And he said, maybe if we saw our shuls turned into stables, it's because we had already turned them into stables. Now that's really not that uh, controversial statement. Um, the Babasali was once asked how come Sephardic Jewry was for the most part protected from the Holocaust and he said because we don't talk in shul um, after Tach V'tat uh, uh, um, destruction that's when they put in a special Meshavarach for people who don't talk in shul okay and if you say that shuls have been turned into stables right now, there's a reason for this. There's a reason. You have to ask yourself why something happens. And um, the, uh, uh, the, the Gemara says that Titus, when he destroyed the base of Migdash, ground flour that was already ground. What does that mean? It means we destroyed the base of Mikdash with our Averis. And, um, and uh, he just destroyed the building. Anyway, I read this letter, and someone sitting on the floor says, I must object. Now, this is not a group participation program, so you can imagine how surprised I was. And he said, are you saying that Chochmah Lublin did something wrong? That the yeshiva was turned into stables? No one has a right to question the Kedoshim. I said, the point I'm trying to make is, he said, I lost 80 members of my family in the Holocaust. You think it's because they did something wrong? No one's allowed to say that. Ask the yeshiva. No one can say it. And he started to cry. And I stood there. And I weighed my options. And I said, we should all have a nechama, and I sat down. So, someone came over to me afterwards, in the category of world-famous speakers. He said, you know, there was a number of famous speakers in the audience, because each one of us was doing a different kinna. I said, I know. He says, I went over to one and said, I thought of four excellent answers that Orlovsky could have given. And he said, I thought of six. And we both agreed that none of them were as effective as yours. Which led me to comment that I do my best speaking when I keep my mouth shut. There was nothing for me to say at that point. Whatever I say, it, you know, it's not, it's not going to deal with the issue. The person is sharing his personal pain. It wasn't an intellectual decision. In fact, it was symptomatic of a problem where, uh, where you're not allowed to ask any questions. This is the first tragedy you're not allowed to ask any questions. The Chazal asked, why was Chorban Bayez Rishon? Why was Chayon Bayez Sheni? Why was Beitar destroyed? The Rishonim asked, why did the Crusades take place and so many Jews were killed? The Achronim asked, Tach V'tach, why did it take place? This is the one tragedy you're not allowed to ask why. It's also to ask why. 
You could agree with the answer or disagree with the answer, but you're not even allowed to ask the question. That makes you wonder. But, uh, but words, words today. And so you have to know what you can say to who. And the Gemara says, just like it's a mitzvah to tell somebody something they're going to listen, it's a mitzvah not to tell somebody something they're not going to listen to. And we just keep talking, talking and talking and talking and faster and faster. And talking heads, you go into any news program, they've got six little windows and everyone's talking, blah, 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 blah. My parents very much wanted me to go to college, so I went to night school in Queens College for a semester. I took uh, Introduction to Psychology and Sociology. I figured I would go into psychology. That was what I was thinking. We were at the table. I think it was 1976, so it was still in the, you know, the leftover from the 60s. My father said, did you sign up for college? I said, yeah. He says, what'd you take? I said, uh, Sociology 101, Psychology 101. Psych and Soch? Every hippie moron takes Psych and Soch. Why don't you take a math class? So I realized at that point, it doesn't matter if I go to college or not, I'm never going to make my parents happy anyway. So I didn't go. When I moved out to L.A., they made another big push for me to go to college. It was very important. And uh, so I said, okay, if I'm going to go anyway to Valley College, I'm going to take what I'm interested in. Something that appeals to me. I took broadcasting and journalism. In the broadcasting uh, class, he told a fascinating thing. There was a fellow by the name of Edward R. Murrow. And uh, he was considered the newsman's newsman. He was supposed to be tremendously objective and honest and straightforward. I think he was interviewing Oppenheimer who had developed the atomic bomb. And they were discussing about the concept of what it means that there are now nuclear bombs. And he said, do you think that mankind will ever destroy itself? And he thought about the question. For like a whole minute. Silence. You just, the camera's on him and he goes, no, I don't think that they will. And what my professor said, the brilliance of Edward R. Murrow was he knew to keep his mouth shut because you're basically asking the person who developed the atomic bomb if we're going to destroy ourselves. Would anybody have the patience to do that today? So do you think mankind will ever destroy itself? You know, let me ask you another question. <laughs> I, it's not as bad in America, but uh, here, when the prime minister tries to speak, everyone just cuts him off. He can't get out two words. And he was like, can't have a bad man. I tell you, can't have a can't get out two words. And you listen, listen to what they have to say. We can't listen. So someone gets up to speak and we don't like them, everybody walks out. Or someone's giving a class or a lecture on university, we have to make noise and disrupt it and, and you know and stop because people we don't want to hear anybody talk. People just talk and talk and talk and their words have they don't stop to think what they're saying. Words of, of lost meaning. Every time you say a word, a malach is created, a good one or a bad one. And they're all going to be there when you get there. I have to think very carefully, what am I saying? Elo advarim, every word that I say can turn into Torah. I have the power through my debo to be able to create something in this world. Baruch sha'amara hayoha olam. If we, if we learned how to work on our Dibor, then we'd be in a position. What, is, what does it say in the sixth paragraph of Pirkei Avos in the Brisa? 
Because the Dibur belongs to somebody, and I've, I'm mechabed that. I put it where it belongs, that's the Geula. Otherwise, the Dibur isn't Kolos. So, Amir Hashem, this year we will uh, at least use this opportunity to work on our Dibur. Look twice before you speak once. Make sure the iron comes before the pay. And there will always be a chance to say something afterwards. The odds that you won't be able to say something is very slight. That's when there are parents and teachers who feel like, I have to say right now. I have to say it now. I can wait. I can wait until there's a better time to say it. Okay, so we're going to take some questions that are related to Tisha B'Av. Nanami asks, do you have any suggestions for being down the Well, they say everything that a person has serves a purpose. So what's the purpose of a Krima cup? It means like a twisted way of thinking. So you can be down the Kafskos. means sometimes it's an exercise to look at something and say, what do you think is going on? Have you ever been wrong? I moved into an apartment, into a building that was under construction, and we didn't have uh, sargim, we didn't have uh, bars on the Mirpeset. We weren't really allowed to live there without them, you know? So I spoke to the guy who was supposed to make the sargim, and he was supposed to bring them a particular day, and he didn't come. And uh, I followed, I call him up. I said, where am I sargim? He said, shachachti. I said, Shachachta? You forgot? How could you forget something like this? I have little children here. It's dangerous. Huh? And I really got very, very angry. And he said, I don't understand a word that you're saying. I hung up the phone. I was so angry. I mean, this is, this is you know, issues of, of, of serious danger. And the person who hooked me up with him afterwards said, the guy called me and said he couldn't figure out what you were so upset about. He said, Shachavti, I fell down and I hurt my back and I can't work. I, I'm, I'm waiting to get out of bed so that I can do your, your bars. <laughs> I'm sure I heard Shachavti. He said, Shachavti. And uh, it's, a, it's a good lesson. How many times do you, you know, find yourself in a situation and you're sure the facts are clear to you? I was running a Shabbaton. I was having a very hard time. There was this one kid who kept pulling all of the kids over to his house. They wouldn't come to the program. They wouldn't this. I got very upset. So I said to somebody, point them out to me. You know, we'll, we'll call the guy Bob Schwartz. Yeah. I said, when Bob Schwartz comes, put him out to me because I'm going to throw him out of the Shabbaton and tell him he could never come back. Anyway, they say, there he is. So I go over to him and said, listen, you're out. You're out. You're out of the Shabbaton. Yeah, are out of white. Don't ever come back. He says, why? What did I do? He says, what did you do? You spent the whole Shabbos pulling kids away, going over to your house. He goes, no, I didn't. I said, don't lie to me. Lying is like the worst. Just at least own up to it. He goes, I didn't. The kid was so upset. I said, I asked everybody, and they told me Bob Schwartz has been taking kids away to his house. He goes, I'm not Bob Schwartz. I said, hi, David Orlowski, it's really nice to meet you. <laughs> we, we later went on to become good friends. <laughs> but as Mark Twain says, keep your words soft and sweet. It'll be easier when you have to eat them later. So look at a situation and say, I don't know. And there's so many factors involved, and I don't know that goes into it. That just the fit, the pasnished, is just, it's not, it's not appropriate. Anonymous asks, how are we supposed to balance feeling happy, blessed, and seeing the good in everything, and feeling sad that we're in Gullis, realizing how much we are missing and yearning for Gula? Hi. <sighs> Remotion Feinstein holds you never allowed to listen to music. 
because of the Chorban. Never allowed. Um, because the Chorban is so real. Most people don't do that. Most people can't go through the nine days without listening to music. So they find acapella or something, you know, but they, they become addicted to music. So the Gemara says like this. There were people who stopped eating meat after the Chorban. So he reminded them of the Korbanos. And they stopped uh, drinking wine. Because he reminded them of the Sochim that they would pour. So Rabbi Shua says, and you shouldn't eat bread. Because these are Rimbanachas. Okay, we won't eat bread. Said, well, you can't eat fruit because they used to bring the Bikurim. Says, okay, we'll eat vegetables. Says, well, then you shouldn't drink water. Because on Sukkot they would pour water on the Mismeach. They didn't know what to say. So what can we do? Whatever the Chachamim Aser, that's what's Aser. And you can't, you can't go beyond that. Now, having said that, I remember hearing that after Vigda Miller passed away, one of his grandchildren said that, you know, I one time went into Zadie's room to jump on his bed and there was no mattress, it was just a board. I remember I asked him when I was a little older, I said, Zadie, how can we have a mattress? He says, since the Holocaust, I couldn't sleep on a bed. No, a lot of it comes down to what you can handle. I think today, since people are so sad, it's so hard for them to stay happy under the best of circumstances, that uh, it's very difficult. So, you know, don't feel like I have to take it further than the Chacham said. You know, whatever, whatever the restrictions that have been put on us, because of the Chorban, we have to observe. And more than that, um, the general rule when it comes to precious is uh, not if it hurts. Not if it hurts. And if it hurts, don't do it. Chanaji asks, if someone texts Lashon Hara to you privately or on a group chat, what's the appropriate response? Is there a way to show disapproval without being preachy? Is it permissible to sympathize with the intent of helping them see a different perspective. I heard a, a word from Rabbi Leff, Rabbi Moshe Matasyo, many years ago. He says, the Gemara says, why are your fingers shaped like pegs? So if you hear Lashon Hara, you can put them in your ears. And then the Gemara says, why is the little fleshy part of your ear flexible? So if you hear Lashon Hara, you can put it in your ear. He says, what do I need either one of those two methods for? Just walk away. So he says, ideally, if you hear Lashon Hari, you should walk away, but you don't always have that option. So if a people are speaking straight Lashon Hari, put your fingers in your ear because you're making a macha. This is wrong, and I don't want to hear this. But sometimes someone's asking him about somebody for a shidduch or for a business deal, and for him it's mutter. So you're not allowed to listen, but you don't have to make a macha, so that's why you put the little part of your ear in. What about today? Um, I have never seen anybody respond well when someone says, I think that's Lush and Har. I've never seen a situation where a person says, oh, I appreciate that, thanks for pointing that out. Usually they get angry. Oh, and you do everything right, and you never do anything wrong, and you're such a tzaddik. I don't know what it is. People become very defensive. So if you're in a group chat where the main subject is Lashon Hara, I would get out of it. And I would not stay there. Um, and if it's a group chat, like, for example, in Harnof, there's a, you know, a community chat which tells people about, you know, uh, different services and where to go for things, etc. Anyway, somebody came on and did a whole rant against uh, people who are doing something. Is that an important one? And I was going to write back and say, this is not the forum for it. If you want to go speak Lush and Horror, go to the Lush and Horror uh, uh, page and spread Lush and Horror about people. That's not what this is for. 
This is for, where can I go to get this form? How do I go to get this filled out? Does anybody know where, you know, you can get this? You know, it's not here to, to, to write, you know, diatribes against people. I didn't do it, but that's what I should have done. Um, so, uh, if it's, if it's, uh, a site that's just dedicated to Lush and Hara, I would just get off of it. And if it's one this night, and occasionally people do, you can do a generic, um, let's please keep this forum only for its uh, intended purpose and not to speak about other people. And that's it for this Dish Above program. Uh, I am, if we have a Tishba program next year, I hope it'll be uh, filled. Sasain v'simcha v'nas yagahin v'yanacha b'shuvi b'shuvi Yerushalayim. It'll be an emes ha'gaula and happiness. All of the beautiful brachas for Klai Yisrael. We're so close. The big people have said this. We're so close. We're right at the end. It could be the thing that you say or don't say can make the difference. And of course, the famous classic, Horton Hears Who, where nobody believes this place exists, and he tells them, make noise so they can hear you. And finally, it's one little kid who offers up his voice, and suddenly they can hear them. And he saves everybody. So it might be us. We might be that little who in Whoville who's able to finally bring the Geula. It's got to be somebody. Let it be us. Mir Hashem. We should be Zaycha to an Amasa Geula.